begin. Father, we praise you and we thank you for this privilege and opportunity we have to come together this morning. We thank you for your great love that brings us to this place. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to hear what you'd have for us, that you'd help me to share what you'd have me to share. Help us each to be sensitive to your spirit this morning, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. To welcome you all here to this morning and also those who may be uh, viewing it on the Internet. We thank you for your participation. So. This morning I'd like to talk about uh, one of those uh, little subjects that causes hesitation a lot of times, uh, in most cases. But uh, when it comes to our relationship with God, there should be none at all. It's that little ten-letter word commitment. <laughs> and uh, Jesus said in Mark 9:23 and through 6, he says, Then he said to all, Anyone who wants to follow me must put aside his own desires and conveniences to carry his cross with him every day and keep close to me. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it, and whoever insists on keeping his life will lose it. And what profit is there in gaining the whole world? And then it means forfeiting oneself. When I, the Messiah, come in my glory and in the glory of, my, of the Father and the holy angels, I will be ashamed then of all who are ashamed of me and of my words now. So it's an interesting portion. You know, obviously Christ is speaking of those verses. Was it up there? There we go. That was Luke 9, 23 through 26. And so when we look at these things, I mean, it's obvious, it's self-explanatory when Christ talks about these things to us. And it's talking about commitment. And we have a hard time with that sometimes. I know that uh, when uh, uh, guys are younger, that it's a hard word when all of a sudden we start saying commit to a marriage or to a woman when we decide to marry and stuff. But uh, commitment is sometimes a hard thing to do. And uh, it's, it's one of the things that we really need to evaluate when we're talking of the Lord. He says to us, consider and count the cost of following me. And, you know, I know that Christ is saying that, but when we logically look at that, there's really not a, nothing to, to really compare it to. I mean, when Christ says, uh, are you, uh, count the cost whether or not you're going to follow me, what is, the, what's the, what is the alternative to that? A godless eternity. And uh, so I want to look at today, and, and primarily we're going to be in Joshua and then also in 1 Samuel 4, but... I want to look at Joshua, and it ends in Joshua asking the people who you are going to serve, and that's in Joshua 24, 14, and 15. He says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods of your ancestor, the ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord means un is, seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond Euphrates or the gods of the Ammonites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. When we look at this particular portion of scripture, you know, we look at verse 14. We don't have to go back there. But he says, throw away the gods your ancestors served. So he's not simply implying that their ancestors served these false gods, but they themselves had them in their possession. Um, throw them away, he says, that uh, he knows that he's telling them to get rid of these false gods that mean absolutely nothing. And this was a tremendous challenge to all the tribes of Israel to consider their covenant with God. He is giving them an opportunity to choose for themselves who they're going to serve. And from the first five books, you know, the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy, Moses is showing them God's leadership through him. And he has done some miraculous things through, the nation, through Moses to the nation of Israel and to those surrounding nations, uh, specifically Egypt, as they were coming out of there. And it was uh, amazing to them. And here in Joshua, he did some pretty amazing things. For the first time, they crossed the Jordan River and they come across Jericho and that whole battle that took place then. So God was doing some pretty amazing things, obvious things that the children of Israel should have noticed. 24, 16 through 18 says, Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued our fathers from their slavery in the land of Egypt. He is the one who did mighty miracles before the eyes of Israel as we traveled through the wilderness and preserved us from our enemies when we passed through their land. 
It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. Yes, we choose the Lord, for he alone is God. What, a, what an acknowledgement, right? They thought about that stuff and they said, we know all those things that God did in the past. We know those things. So it's beyond doubt that God is who he says he is and that there really isn't too much of a choice whom we will serve. We're going to serve God. They took ownership, didn't they? They looked at this, this situation that Joshua laid out before him, and they said, our God, recognizing that what God did for them. In 24, 19 through 20, it says, But Joshua replied to the people, You can't worship the Lord God, for he is holy and jealous. He will not forgive your rebellion and sins. If you forsake him and worship other gods, he will turn upon you and destroy you, even though he has taken care of you for such a long time. And the people responded in verse 21. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. What I, you look at this and you ask yourself, or at least I ask myself, is this one of those emotional decisions that the children of Israel made? I mean, here they have Joshua. They know who he was. He was a pretty mighty guy. I mean, God used him in miraculous ways as they were um, defeating these nations. And the wisdom that God gave Joshua as he was instructing him as what to do and taking some of these nations that they were coming up against. But, and, and I think to myself, is this one of those times where, you know, people, specifically here, the children of Israel, they're all hyped up by what Joshua is saying, and he's kind of putting them on the spot, isn't he? He's saying, who are you going to serve this day? Are you going to serve me or are you going to serve the gods that your ancestors are the ones you got hidden away in your tents? You ever make one of those emotional decisions and regret it later? You get all hyped up over the thing and the next thing you know, you suddenly ask yourself, wait a minute, you mean I got to fight? <laughs> I remember one time when Doral and I went to Hawaii, uh, I think it was the last time as a matter of fact, and uh, we, we, we don't, I mean, once the sun goes down, we have nothing to do, right? So we just sit around or we chat or play games or whatever the case may be. And so one time during the day, we visited one of these little resort areas, right? And so they tried to sell us a timeshare. And so it sounded like a good idea, right? So we were all ready to go. And, and, uh, but they gave you a few days to think about it before you actually signed the papers, you know? And the more we thought about it, you know, the money involved and blah, blah, blah. And we're thinking, we ain't going to do this. And uh, we didn't do that, fortunately, because those timeshares, if you're familiar with them or if you have one, you realize that it's one of those things you pay thousands of dollars to and, and maybe, maybe or maybe not get your money's worth out of them. But uh, it's one of those things you just look back and you go, what was I thinking? But we do that in life. I mean, we all have probably been there in our life where we made a decision and said, what was I thinking? Yeah, I mean, especially when you go out and buy a new car, right? You don't have any chance to turn this in. Once you make a decision, it's final, and you got to live with that decision. And uh, here, the children of Israel are posed with these, this question that Joshua throws out to them. What are you going to do? He had a pretty good idea of how that commitment would go, didn't, wouldn't he, didn't he? He saw these individuals through that time, and he saw how kind of wishy-washy they were and the crazy decisions and it's always been amazing to me as you read through those first five books in Joshua where those leaders of Israel would look back at Joshua and they say boy I wish we were back in Egypt anybody ever wish you were back in prison <laughs> you know, it's like come on guys but that's what they were saying right we wish we were back there and under that that taskmasters and beating us and giving us the food that we had and all that good stuff and and here they are. In Joshua 21, 25, it says, In those days they had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. That's an amazing statement when you think about it. Because here they just made this commitment, and now this is in the end of Judges. So this is uh, approximately 400 years later. What do you do with that? When you start thinking about the children of Israel and where they've come through the book of Judges, the number of individuals that God raised up in the book of Judges to deliver them, yet they had no real godly example, but they weren't committed to the decision the forefathers made some 400 years ago when they stood with Joshua and said, we will serve the Lord. 
So from the end of Joshua till this point, they had learned almost nothing that the judges had or shared as they ruled the nation of Israel at that time. God used the judges to deliver them from the enemy, and from, from the first chapter of Judges to the first chapter of 1 Samuel, it is about 430 years that have taken place. That's kind of a long time. It's, almost, it's about the length of time they were in Egypt. So we've just moved from the book of Judges to 1 Samuel, where Eli is the current priest at that particular time. And he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And, and to recap, Samuel goes on the scene in chapter 1 and gives, is given to the Lord by his parents. And then in chapter 2, we learn of Eli's wicked sons. Eli was a character in himself because, uh, as we'll see in a bit here, the Lord wasn't too thrilled with the way this guy was was uh, inspiring the people, if you will. But these two guys, his sons, um, would teach us at least one lesson. I mean, Hophni and Phinehas, they were wicked sons of this priest, and yet they can teach us so much if we were to take the time and just think about them and what they did. Their father was this priest, so he was an intercessor to man from God and the people of Israel. But these two boys, they grew up with that. They saw this man who was supposedly this intercessor between God and man, and they lived that life. They observed those things. So clearly, from this particular portion of time, you can hang around God's representative, you can hear the message, you can go to church, but if you not, do not commit to him, you're lost. Judas Iscariot was another prime example of that, wasn't he? hung around Jesus, and yet he killed himself. Luke chapter 14, 26 says, Anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Then say husband. Uh, yeah, more than his own life. Otherwise, he cannot be my disciple. So that's Christ telling us that if we want to serve him, we must commit to him. God calls to Samuel in chapter 3, and here in chapter 4, we find... Samuel, or Eli. Here we find the children of Israel are about to do battle with the Philistines. Now this is an interesting portion of scripture because here they are, those 400 and some years later, where they had these judges ruling, they came through Ruth and all those things that took place, and here they are, and now they're standing here with a decision to go against the Philistines. If you read in the book of Joshua, the Philistines, God told Joshua, hey, that's yet to be conquered. It's, I still have all that for you. But, you know, he's getting on in years. Felt good, but God had that land still for them. So it begs the question, why didn't the children of Israel go to Eli for God's direction? Or why didn't Eli intervene and give the children of Israel a yes or no? Well, yeah, that's good, or let me ask God. So in chapter 2, God, through another man of God, told Eli he and his family would be cut off. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 29 through 31. This is this prophet or this man of God speaking in behalf of God to Eli. He says, Why then are you so greedy for all the other offerings which are brought to me? Why have you honored your sons more than me? For you and they have become fat from the, beast, the best of the offerings of my people. Therefore, I, the Lord God of Israel, declare that although I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi could always be my priest, it is ridiculous to think that what you are doing can continue. I will honor only those who honor me, and I will despise those who despise me. I will put an end to your family so that no lo you will no longer serve as priests. Every member will die before his time. None, none shall live to be old, and his house will die by the sword, it says. Eli's house will die by the sword. Apparently, he used his offer to please himself and his family rather than God. Now, I know that um, when we were credentialed, and I think they asked that question of every minister who's going up for credentials, they ask you, are you going to use this for the benefit of God, basically, or are you going to use this for personal gain, this position? And I guess there's some that do that kind of thing. But here we see that Eli, he might have started out good, but Obviously, he drifted out to a place where God wasn't too thrilled with him. 
As a result, God abandoned him and told him that all his family would die by the sword and no one, all but one, would be alive at an older age just to grieve of the loss that they had. So it's an interesting story about Eli. And yet here we are in 1 Samuel chapter 4, and we're going to read the first portions of it. In 1 Samuel 4, 1, And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. And in those days the Philistines mustered for war against Israel, and Israel went out to battle against them. They encamped at Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. The Philistines drew up in a line against Israel, and when the battle was joined, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men on the field of battle. So you can just imagine what's going up here, state two. So you can just imagine what's going on here. These guys confidently were thinking they're going to go up there and do this, and all of a sudden, they get defeated by the Philistines, and 4,000 of them die. So the children of Israel decided they were going to go into this battle without inquiring of God. Why? Because God was foreign to them. They had no righteous example. They had no voice talking to them about who God was. So this section of scripture gives us a revelation of Israel's superstition and just how far they were from God. It showed us how strong their self-sufficiency was, how confident they were in themselves and their selfishness. With no thought of seeing God's direction, they go into this battle against the Philistines. Verse 3. When the troops came to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord put us to rout today before the Philistines? Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord here from Shiloh, so that it may come among us and save us from the power of the enemies. Doesn't that sound like a lot of folks today? It really does, doesn't it? We claim to be Christians, we, they. They live a life without desire of serving God. And when problems begin, self-righteousness steps in and says, Where's God? What did I do? How come I'm in this kind of situation anymore? Not realizing that our lives are so far away from God, we blame him when things go bad in our lives. Verse 4. So the people sent to Shiloh and brought there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of hosts, who is enthroned on the cherubim. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they were with the Ark and the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, the Israelites gave a mighty shout so that all the earth resounded. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shouting, they said, what does this great shouting in the camp of the Hebrews mean? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into camp, the Philistines were afraid, for they said, gods have come into the camp. They also said, woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. It's apparently they knew who this God of the Israelites were. They were afraid. And they probably would have continued to be afraid had the children of Israel been where they needed to be with God. Verse 7 says, The Philistines were afraid. They said, God has come into the camp. They said, Woe to us, for nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who can deliver us from the power of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with every sort of plague in the wilderness. I mean, this is over 400 years this took place, right? Because they're referencing Moses coming out of Egypt. This is even before Joshua. And they're referencing that time. So they at least heard the stories of the might and the power of God as he led the children of Israel out of Egypt 400 plus years ago. Their forefathers passed it down and reminded them of these things. They knew these things. And then their leaders said, take courage and be men, O Philistines, in order not to become slaves to the Hebrew as they have been to you. Be men and fight. Verse 10, so the Philistines fought, Israel is defeated, and they fled everyone to his home. And there was a very great slaughter, for they fell of, of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. So how did this happen? They brought the ark of God into the camp what happened in the past should have taken place now. That as they had carried it down to the Jordan River, it split apart. They knew those things. They referenced those things. The water had been cut off so that they could cross over. They thought that this presence of the ark in the camp would bring victory. Why were they defeated and the ark of the, Phil of, of the Lord taken by the Philistines? The Israelites weren't honest with God, were they? They didn't even think that because of their self-righteous attitudes 
that their selfishness that God was not moved to help them. They were so lulled to spiritual sleep, they had no idea that God wasn't even with them. And they carried into battle a box. A pretty box, but a box. They were superstitious enough to think that that box would deliver them. A box doesn't deliver anything. But it is the one who resides over, around, that God who is the presence of that box, the Ark of the Covenant. God is the one that they should have had their confidence in. Boxes don't save. You can create all the hype until you want here in San Diego, until they all hear the voice, your voice, shouting. But if you're not broken and contrite before God, all you get is a lot of noise, laryngitis, and a sore throat. <laughs> the Ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So what happened? Did God fail them? No. No. They did what so many of us do. We jump into things without regards to God, and we allow ourselves to be influenced by the world until it dominates our lives. And we don't realize that God has left us. Does that story sound familiar? Like maybe back in Judges where we read of Samson? Didn't realize that the Spirit of God had left him once Delilah cut his hair. We might go to church once a week, so I, so I don't get a, a phone call from someone asking where I've been. Maybe I'll just watch on Facebook or a web page. I know we brought, bring that up all the time, but it's there. It is there. Maybe I can do my housework while I'm listening. You can see how important these things are. How our godly relationship is so important to us. Or maybe I can scan the internet while I have another page open listening to the message. We don't pay attention to it enough to apply it to our lives and... I don't care who stands up here, and they could give the greatest message you ever heard, but if it doesn't change you, or you don't change with what you've heard, it almost meant nothing. We have to take this word and apply it to our lives in order for it to mean anything. The children of Israel didn't realize that, and so they brought this box into their thinking, and sometimes we think that we are good. And we are deceived. We could be living at peace. You know, the psalmist said that, right? In Psalm 73, he says, you know, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, my feet almost slipped. And it's so easy for us to look at people and to realize they don't go to church. Look at how blessed they are. But then I went into the sanctuary and I realized their end. They're lost. And Satan is going to lull people to sleep so that they will think they're good enough to enter into heaven. You can almost ask anybody unless they're a, a devout, some other crazy religion, are you going to heaven? Oh, yep, I am. I'm a good person. They will all tell you that. Because they think that because they're a good person, they're going there. But when trouble comes, we act like the children of Israel, don't we? Why, God? Why did you let me go through this? Where did you go? How come you didn't defend me there during this time? Man, I'm having some financial problems. You know, God says that we're supposed to tithe. Maybe I'll give a dollar next Sunday and see what happens. <laughs> You'd be surprised what people say and do. But God wants a relationship with us always. He wants us to walk with him on a daily basis, to commune with him, to fellowship with him, to worship him, to hear his voice, to allow his spirit to move in our, in our lives so that we can live a joyful life as he has promised in John chapter 10. But it's not easy, is it? It's not natural for us to sacrifice and to, to lay this flesh aside and to persevere into to a relationship with God. It takes work. And Ephesians, through Paul, says, we wrestle day and night against these flesh and blood. We wrestle every day to, to get rid of this flesh and to try to serve God. Paul struggled with it. You know, we idolize Paul. We, we know that he was a great missionary in, pro, or missionary in that time, but yet he struggled with the very same things we struggle with. And we say he's a great man, but he's pretty honest when he says, hey, I'm, I, the things I don't want to do, I do. So he's pretty clear about the struggle that he has. And in Ephesians, he tells us that we wrestle every day. It takes some effort to get rid of the world in us that is constantly fighting us to seek God. It's a constant battle. When our, our lives are pleasing to God, 
We know our position in him, don't you? Those of us, those of you who serve God and you, you fight that fight, you persevere, you walk through there, you know that God is with you. You have been through some tough times, you have had some hard things happen to you, but let me ask, in the midst of those times, was there peace in your life? Yeah. You may not have liked what's going on in your life, but God was there. And he gave you peace and strength to endure, to carry on, to walk through those things. So just like Isaiah says, but now, says the Lord, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, you cannot compare anything the world has to offer with that right there that Isaiah shares. But it's not just what Isaiah shares. It's what the child of God experiences today you realize that he is, in fact, with you during those difficult times because of the peace in your life. Even when the world is taking all kinds of antidepressants and everything else to dull their emotional pain, you are there serving God and allowing him to refresh your spirit, even though you're in the midst of a hard time. And I know that to some this might be foreign, but that's what it is to have a relationship with God. He is there. He is faithful. Sister Dabney said it this morning already, total rest, unconditional surrender to Christ. That's what he's asking us to do. Everything we are, have, ever will have and be, we surrender it to Christ. And as we do those things, he is God in our lives. He does the things that he's promised. He doesn't forsake us. He doesn't leave us alone. He allows us to go through some things, but he doesn't leave us. He's a faithful God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Lord, I know, we know, that they're not just mere stories. But Lord, these are the events of people that have taken place centuries, millennia ago. And Lord, you spoke to their heart. You gave them as our example so that we might learn the lessons through your word. Help us, Father, to hear these things. Help us, Lord, so that we won't make those mistakes, that we will realize where we are in you. Father, if we're not walking where we should be, Lord, if the world has encroached upon our spiritual man way too much, help us, Lord, to recognize that and to cast it aside. Lord, and to surrender, to submit before you, Father. I praise you, Lord. We are all, we all, Father, struggle with the world encroaching on us. We all struggle with the worldliness and what the society imposes on us. But Father, we have a choice that we can make. We can find quiet time with you and be strengthened by the inner man as we seek you and pray and worship and all those things. Help us, Lord, today. We praise you, Lord. I thank you. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior and you'd like to do so today. Can I see your hand and we'll pray with you? Maybe you're like me and you say, Lord, make me more like you. Make me more like a child of God. Make me more, Father. Help me to surrender these things of the world, Father, so that I can be used of you. If that's you today, maybe you stand with me and we'll just pray again. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for each one that's here. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your mercy and your grace that you show us every day, Father. You forgive us. You love us. You're patient with us. You're kind. You're loving, merciful. So many other things. Lord, I pray that you would just draw us unto yourself, Father. As we've heard before, make us hungry for you, Lord, for more of you. I love you, Lord. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? We serve a mighty God. So glad that he loves us and he cares for us and that he's patient and merciful to us. He's a great God. Hallelujah.